The Lord be with you, Pillar community, and anyone else who's found themselves with us today virtually. It's a gift to be with you. We gather to worship Jesus Christ today. Whether you find yourself in West Michigan or Washington, in the United States or Uganda, in your living room or your back porch maybe, we worship Jesus Christ together today. We worship to be reminded that you belong. You're forgiven. The Spirit of God is with you. And at the table, we're reminded that Jesus loves you. He offered his life for you. And we're going to participate in communion together today virtually. If you'd like to grab a cracker, or juice, whatever you have available to you, feel free to do that and ready yourself for that. That'll be in a few minutes. As we prepare for worship, the Comline family would like to share their greetings with you. The Lord be with you, beloved Pillar community. We can't wait to... Pay us on the handy. Until then, let's worship together. So wherever you find yourself today, locationally, spiritually, I invite you to take a few minutes to settle your spirit, quiet your heart as the ensemble leads us in our call to worship. my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This morning we gather in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who offers himself to us as our help and our salvation. So let's sing together, Jesus at the center.
be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every shall I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We lift our eyes up for help for so many reasons. Help for the trouble of sin in our lives and in our world. Help for crying out to God, why God? How long God? Our world and our lives are in need of help. Just a mention of words like racism, pandemic, violence, poverty, are enough to paint a pretty clear picture that we need the Lord's help. As we begin our prayer through the song, Father, Only in Your Power, I invite you to take a few moments of silent prayer and confession. Let's pray together.
Now hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Jesus Christ is for us. He is our help. Believe this and be at peace. Christ accomplishes this peace for us, which is why we would be a people who want to seek peace in our lives and in the community around us. You'll do that on your own to each sector in which you live and work, and we'll also do it together. I'd like to highlight for us the Give link on the website to support the mission and ministry of the church, as well as the Pillar Responding to COVID link that you might find helpful as you seek to engage in peacemaking ways, peacemaking ways in our community. In addition, we'd like to invite you to extend peace in both prayer and action to Harvey Jacobs and his family. His wife Lois, a dear saint of our community, passed away last Monday evening after a battle with cancer. Her family gathered on Thursday to celebrate her life and to grieve her death. This summer, we've entered into a series of sermons titled Letters, which will take us through the book of Philippians. Throughout the series, we're inviting different people from our community to write a letter to the church and then read it for us. Today, Angela Wagenveld, who will begin serving as a church elder this summer, has written a letter to the church. Listen to this. Grace and peace to you, beautiful Pillar community. I thank God for your desire to make a difference in the city of Holland by making coffee, making masks, and making friends. I remember with joy the love you have shown to immigrants, to visitors, and to college students through meals shared together in homes, in the lower level, and on the lawn. For the last five years, our children have grown up in these pews, sharing with us the rich liturgies, music, and sacraments that point us over and over again to our Savior. We have internalized scripture, lamented, rejoiced, and prayed together. My continuing prayer for us, dear Pillar community, is that Christ would become ever more and more precious and real to us, more so than our own families, our own thoughts, our own heartbeats. Christ, help us to see you in the faces of our town, the black, brown and white faces you have made in the skin tones you created and love. Help us to seek after and work for justice. Remind us often that your kingdom is here among us and that your work of renewing all things has already begun. Grant us the gift of being agents of all the good grace you long to bestow on us your creation. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's respond together in song by singing, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take my life and Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in endless praise. 
my voice. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee, filled with messages from Thee. Take my love. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be only ever up for thee, ever only all for thee. Thank you so much to the ensemble, Liv, Meredith, Anna, Jake, and Angela. It's so good to hear from you. Would you pray with me as we begin? Holy Spirit, we are listening to you. Unite us as only you can so that whether we're watching from our homes or gathering together while still distance on the lawn, we may experience unity with one another and with you. Open our hearts to be both comforted and challenged by your word and your truth. In your name we pray, amen. I was meeting with a friend of mine the other day out on the lawn after not seeing each other for a few months as it is these days. And almost immediately after we started talking, she said, I want to talk about fear. Okay. She shared with me that as she was talking to a neighbor a few weeks back, um, suddenly in the conversation, the neighbor looked at her and said, oh, so you're on that side. Walls up, division, encampment. Rooted in, as my friend reflected, what she believed to be fear. And it got me to thinking, Fear is interesting. One of those buzzwords that Christians use often and and often want to make pretty black and white, faith over fear, but I think might have more tones of gray than we might initially think. I remember another, another friend of mine asking me one time, is fear a sin? It can be difficult to categorize what with many a resounding do not fear reverberating off the pages of scripture. We'll get back to fear again in a minute, but right now, as we're in this series called Letters, let's listen together to a section of Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is how Philippians 2 begins. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being full of one accord and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to exploited, to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking form of a slave, being born into human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you happen to notice that interesting line bringing us into this great hymn, having the same love? 
the same love. Maybe keep that in mind. What we have before us is Paul speaking to some kind of factioning in the church, in his church. We're not explicitly told the source, but we are shown the symptoms. Division and pain, pride and apathy. And yes, we don't know the source exactly, but we know those symptoms. Don't we? Symptoms that have marked the church throughout time and history, symptoms that play out in new ways even today. We know the symptoms. And quite frankly, while our details are limited in regards to the way these first century church plants operated, I have a sense of the nature of sin and the role of fear in the world then and now and even among believers in Christ Jesus. The one in whom our belonging we claim is our only comfort in life and death. And since I said it again, fear, let's make some clarifications that I, that I hope will be helpful. The phenomenon of fear has really fascinated me for a long time. Physiologically, of course, our bodies have a created center to identify and help process our fear. It's in the brain, it's called the amygdala. And without it, and there are a handful of people in the world without it, if you're interested or curious to hear more, I'd encourage you to find my favorite NPR podcast, season one of Invisibilia, and check it out. Without it, it becomes a lot more difficult to keep yourself safe and and quite simply alive. And so our body has this built-in fear system, which I would argue is quite helpful and necessary. It's why you might wear a mask in a pandemic or wear a seatbelt when you drive. It's fear, but it's not the kind of fear we're talking about today. So on the flip side, and track with me here, uh, there are millions of Americans, and experts would say up to 50% of our nation, myself included, who would identify themselves as a number six on the Enneagram, which, if you don't know, is a tool to help identify behavior and motivation um, by uncovering the tendencies that we carry as individuals that are probably more likely to fall under the, the category of vice than virtue. So, while the generous title of Enneagram Sixes is loyalists, essentially, we Sixes are all motiva- motivated by our fear. Um, each decision that's made is processed through layers and layers of worry and worst-case scenarios. As in every time I receive a text message or email, it's probably because someone's mad at me. And so whether you, you would identify as a Six or not, In this case, fear becomes not so much of a helpful life-preserving agent as it does a driving factor to anxiety, and it is at risk of taking everything over in reactivity and defensiveness. And as I mentioned before, fear is also named in the Bible at large, so apparently it's not a new concept for Christians. Interestingly, when it is mentioned, it's really named not so much as a sin as it is a folly. It's unnecessary. It's not needed. You're limiting yourself when you're driven by your fear, an overactive part of the brain that was created originally to be helpful to us. And now, obviously, I'm not a physician, I'm not a psychologist, but it doesn't take a whole lot of insight to notice both the church and the world trying to navigate themselves a path through these two realities. It's always been true, but it's been increasingly recently harder to ignore. Do I need to name them? Even the systems of fear at work around us We're quite literally conditioned to view the world through a lens of fear from long-standing political campaign tactics, both sides, I'm not picking, to the media that we take in every day, which isn't even to mention the personal ache of fear tailored to each one of us. 
child goes to play at a friend's house, will anything happen? I'm not married yet. Will it just be me forever? The pandemic is still alive and well. Will I get sick? Will my job remain stable? I don't want to be a downer, but I do want to name the reality here. Can you be honest with yourself about fear? Systemic, personal, both? And since we know the symptoms, it can cause the division, the disconnecting, the reactivity. Maybe it's time to face the source. And I'm not talking about the helpful voice inside of us telling us to wait till the cars are passed to cross the street. Can we face it today? The good news is you don't have to do it alone. While Paul doesn't use the word fear explicitly, he does explicitly speak to its inverse. Remember that introductory line again, having the same love? There are many who would argue that fear's opposite is not courage, as you might expect, maybe, uh, but love. And in a Christ kingdom reality, I believe it's love. It's why later in Scripture, in another letter, 1 John, uh, we find this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And so what I really want to say is not courage over fear or even faith over fear, but love over fear. And so when everyone around you is encamping themselves, siloing themselves on this side or that side, because after all, it is safer there, return to the words that we heard just a minute ago in Philippians 2. There is where we find fear's inverse, its opposite, in the form of love, big L, love. And in two ways, I find. Fear is confronted by love in being received in and also offered out. Love received and love offered. And since I want to keep the main thing, the main thing, Let's start with Christ. When fear creeps in, there is love to be received from Christ. Verse 6 again offers us a glimpse of this love. For Jesus, who the, he, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born into human likeness. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You have a God who loves you. We say this often at Pillar, that Christ died for you. Christ was raised for you. He reigns in power for you. He prays for you. And in case you missed that last part, I'll say it again. He prays for you. Christ did all of that here on earth for you, quite literally going to hell and back again, but it's not enough. Even now, he's still at it. He is praying for you as he speaks. That is love. Article 26 of the Belgic Confession, which is a statement of the Reformed faith that was written back in the 1500s, says this, for neither in heaven nor among the creatures on earth is there anyone who loves us more than Jesus Christ does. Although he was in the form of God, Christ nevertheless emptied himself, taking human form and the form of a slave for us. And he made himself like his brothers, brothers and sisters in every respect. Suppose we had to find another intercessor. Who would love us? more than he who gave his life for us, even though we were enemies. In the face of an unpredictable world and a future that is unknown, in light of fear that causes dissension and division and partitioning, Paul says, 
Christ. Christ's love. Look to Christ. I love what Libby LeFaber said in her testimony a couple of weeks ago. She said, our new normal is Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Because in Jesus, you get to live free. Free in his spirit. Pr- free in his perfect love that casts out all fear. Turn to Jesus. Turn to that Jesus. Author Nona Jones shares in her book uh, an experience she had with the church. Nona came from the kind of childhood you really don't want to imagine possible, the bad kind of bad. She was invited to church by a sixth grade classmate. She had never heard of church before, for real. This is what she writes of her experience there. First visit, well, welcome home, Nona, he said. We're so glad you're here. I hope to see you, the next week, see you next week in Sunday school. We have a class just for the youth and have a lot of fun together. I smiled nervously and thanked him for inviting me, having no idea what he was talking about. But before I could get all my words out, a very tall woman walked up to me and gave me a big hug and said, good morning, sweetheart, welcome. She was followed by a line of people, both adults and youth, who offered bright smiles, warm hugs, and words of welcome. I was amazed. I didn't know any of those people, but by the time we sat down, I had been given more hugs and felt more love than I ever had in my life. I didn't know what church was, but whatever it was, I needed more of it. That's Christ. That's what he offers You get to show up and be fully you and you're seen and known and loved for exactly who you are before anything else. That's what it feels like to turn to Jesus. That's what it feels like to be safe in Jesus. And I mean, just be real with me for a second. Has looking around at everything else helped at all? Has staying glued to the news helped anything at all. If you know Jesus, here's your reminder to just stop. Breathe. Receive his love. And if you don't know Jesus, you, you might not have any reason to care what I have to say, but just in case you do, let me say this. He's there. He makes all the difference. He can stop the swirling. He can put the chaos to rest. He wants nothing more than for you to receive his love. He's he's got nothing to gain from it, but you might have everything to gain. Christ showed up in great love and with the promise that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. His perfect love can face and can drive out any version of fear that you're facing today. Now the second way that this big L love confronts fear is by being offered, being given, being poured out of us. And don't even try to skip here if you haven't practiced being on the receiving end of this love first. It just won't end up working right. Let's go back to those first few verses of Philippians 2 and see what Paul has to say about love offered. He says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, there's love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, then make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love. There's that again. Being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The passage starts if, if there is any of these things in Christ. But time and time again, those who study and translate scripture will say that this if really might be more fitting if it's a since 
could also be translated since. Since there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation in love. So apparently it's a given. The Philippians have already been immersed in Christ's love and know what it's like to receive it. Since that, then this. And in case you missed it, Paul's list here is essentially just a fleshed out description of love in action. In unity, in humility, in consideration, in selflessness, love. Have the same love, he says. And then he ends this way. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Since you know Christ Jesus' mind, since you know Christ's love, do the same. It's hard to miss the meaning in that one. And so if you're a Christian, which means that you have Christ in you through his Holy Spirit, Christ's love in you is what will confront the fear in your life and in the life of every single person around you. By living love, you get to offer Christ's love. A friend of mine once shared with me an encounter that he had, which I found to be quite profound. He, in his life, shared that it wasn't all that uncommon for him to find himself in what he would call fear loops. Um, His wife goes to the grocery store in snowy weather and his brain spins until she's home safe. He lays in bed at night thinking through over and over what could have gone wrong at the kids' pool party. He felt trapped by this reality. Those are just two examples. He felt unable to break himself free of it. And so he brought this up to his counselor at some point, and this is how she responded. She wanted him to stop trying to rationally argue himself out of these loops. That's just not how the brain works, she said. Physically, there wasn't actually a way for him to talk himself out of it once he was in it. He would just try but stay stuck in fear. So instead, she said he needed to introduce a new chemical into the conversation, a new chemical to the table. And how to get the serotonin involved? Well, either eat some chocolate or this in the midst of even a fear loop that he found himself in, he should try reaching out to somebody else and not for the purpose of being cared for, but with the purpose of caring for. So send a text message to a friend or write a note to a neighbor to check in. It was through acts of love to other people that he would be released from his fear in those moments, jogging his brain out of a a fear pattern in which he felt out of control. That's literally in our brain chemistry. Have the same love, Paul says. Love is the answer. Let Christ's received love in you flow back out of you to continue to do its subversive, restoring, redeeming work in the world. It heals the world and it heals you. So when the fear inside is waging war, how about love? When you're unsure about how to enter into the conversation of racial injustice, try love. When someone stationed themselves in a different political mindset than you, maybe love. You know what love looks like in Christ. You've received it. And since you've received it, it's yours to offer, to change a narrative in the world. Have the same love. So yes, let's talk about fear, but not without talking about love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And today, we get to experience love in the bread broken, and in the cup poured out, 
love that is to be received for us and our salvation, and love that is then to be poured out. Quincy Havman Gold is going to share with us a little bit of what we understand to be happening when we come to the table. And as he does, the ensemble will also lead us. This is Christ's body given for you. And this is Christ's blood shed for you. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of hope. We come in hope believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come with when with unveiled face we shall behold him made like unto him in this glory when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.